namo tassa bhavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa uttang tamang sankhang namasami <clears throat> so it is a it's a it's a delight to be uh, giving a talk here in the hall at uh, Abayagiri. Not particularly a delight to give a talk in the usual way necessarily, but just a delight that the hall at Abayagiri is still here, and here we are. And we're able to uh, have this puja just uh, a week or so after the uh, disaster which has hit this area. And now we have the blessing of the rain pittering atop this lovely building. <clears throat> the last time I was here was the Katina time last year. It was uh, almost finished, but not quite. The floor was still cement with carpets temporarily thrown down and, well, placed mindfully down. And the uh, walls were black. Now they're nice and striped maple. <clears throat> and it's a big, it's a big thing having a monastery anywhere and particularly here. And so it's a, it's a real relief, obviously, to all of us that uh, the fires have stayed away for now. And we still have a, a monastery. And it's not the case that Ajahn Pasano has to start from scratch another 25 years to get to this point <laughs> again. But if, if it had gone, then I'm sure would have just uh, responded appropriately to the situation as we find ourselves. And it's always what we're doing. You know. We all know the teachings. If we were here and we've been here, coming here long enough and we're in robes and we've heard the teachings again and again and again, so that intellectually we kind of know how things are and how we should be thinking. And there's a lot of shoulds involved often because we know how we, we should be able to respond to things. And yet then there's the reality. And these times when uh, great uncertainty makes itself felt in a way which is um, dangerous. And uh, uh, it, it, uh, threatening, threatening, threatening to our our lives, our, 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 our well-being, and, and the places that we've invested ourselves, then we have these, uh, uh, you know, a chance to really see where we are. And the teachings are such that while we can understand them conceptually easily enough, uh, it takes a long time for most of us for them to sink and to really uh, for us to, if we give ourselves to it, we have a chance to uh, not only learn the teachings and not only enact the teachings, but eventually to become the teachings, to become the truth. The truth of anicca, the truth of dukkha, the truth of, the truth of anatta in our experiences such that we can see it to one degree or another, on one level or another, and yet to really be um, able to be equanimous in the midst of uh, an uncertain, ever-changing, never-satisfying life is not an easy ask. It's really something that takes a, a total commitment in the end, uh, whether we choose to do it uh, fully or, 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 or not in the form of practice we take up. In the end, we, we really have no choice from the Buddhist perspective. It just keeps going until we see the truth and give ourselves to that reality. And the great
precious blessing of this human birth is that we do have that chance. Like the, uh, you know, the, the deer and the, do you have porcupines here? The deer and the other critters, no porcupines. We have lots of porcupines. So if we'd had a fire in temple, I'd be thinking of the, the yes, the deer and also the porcupines. Many other animals around us here, uh, they're also uh, faced with the same reality we are, uncertain, danger, you know, fire comes, it's, there's, there's fear, no doubt, and uh, there's the wish for well-being that we all have, the wish for uh, safety and, and, and pleasure and, and, and happiness. But as human beings, of course, we have the extra crucial capacity to reflect upon and learn from these experiences, whatever our experience is, in a way where it can lead to a freedom from just being bound up into riding the highs and trying to avoid the lows. The pushing and the pulling of I want, I don't want, I hope, I fear. These very understandable uh, emotional, psychological experiences that um, constitute our lives, whoever we are, rich or poor, young or old, male or female. We have the chance to see these for what they are and find a freedom within it so that even though we may be stuck in samsara, it seems, we're actually not stuck. Samsara will never change. It will never be satisfying. That's the truth of, of dukkha that we can see for ourselves, we can understand intellectually, and yet to really get it is uh, something we need to probably get it wrong again and again until we finally um, can let, let go into, surrender into the experience that we find, whatever it is. You know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but it's always dukkha if we are in any way clinging to it. And that's something, of course, then we realize we should stop doing. We shouldn't cling. And uh, those of us who have been practicing for a while, and actually probably pretty quickly when we start practicing, we realize that even though the key to all this is to let go and stop clinging, we can't just do that because we want to. We can't stop clinging if we want to stop clinging. We can't let go just because we want to let go. We're compelled to hold on and cling in some way we can't really understand. So the practice is mainly um, one of awareness and, and uh, with a, 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 uh, in, within the context of, of uh, uh, ethical boundaries that keep us from, from obscuring the heart's natural peace so that we can learn, learn what's happening with this, this compulsive holding on becoming, wanting, identifying, that we are going to be doing whether we want to or not. We realize we're not really in control of our lives. We influence things, we can make choices, and those choices are important, so we need to work with our lives in conscious ways. We work with the conditions by choosing that which will lead to benefit and avoiding that which will lead to some kind of harm, whether it's uh, in our relationships with others, the way we speak, the way we uh, act and conduct our relationships, and whether it's in relation to the way that we conduct our own inner life, the choices we make, how we spend our attention, how we, we, we cultivate a mental space, a psychological, emotional space, which will uh, be conducive to peace and awareness, or whether it'll be distracting and take us away from that. And in that, practice in that path, we all, I'm sure, each of us finds that we can't just do it because we want to do it. We, we have to learn by getting it wrong and finding our limitations and seeing that, that uh, we are more caught than we thought we were, perhaps, more caught, certainly, than we'd like to be. So we don't blame ourselves for not being free. We don't blame ourselves for getting it wrong. We realize this is how it has to be, and this is the stuff we use to learn from. So it's, it's not going wrong if it's going wrong. It's actually the stuff that we need to work with, and it's the stuff which will teach us. It becomes 
if we choose to make it our practice uh, a blessing. Our own mistakes, our own faults and foibles are that, those just those very things which will actually help us to learn what it means to be free. So we learn through learning what it means to suffer. We can't just learn what it means to be free by feeling freedom because we're not free. So we learn what is, what is, it, what is bondage, what is suffering, what is dukkha. We learn through seeing how we are with the reality of our experience in the present moment. And not just, it can help to reflect on how we've been in the past. It can reflect, it can help to, you know, uh, think about how we would like to be in the future to some degree. But mainly we're working always with how we are right now. And part of that, at least for, for me, is noticing that there's a great uh, constant rejection outward or backward in time to some kind of idea of how I'd like to be or where I want to be, where I want to get to. And uh, a momentum, a, a, a lot of habitual um, uh, direction that the attention goes, which is away from just this right now, just the body sitting here in the hall, just right now, as it rains. The sounds of the rain, the sounds of my voice, the sounds of whatever else we hear right now. These smells and tastes. And what's going on in the mind right now? This. We're always working with this, and that's a blessing in the end, because it means we don't need to get somewhere else in order to do our work. We always have what we need. It's a matter of once we get a sense of the direction of practice, remembering, remembering that the choices we're making in the present moment are consequential, they're important. We don't have to wait until we have the right conditions to meditate in the right way to finally do the practice that will help me be free. Although, of course, conditions are important and we do want to find good conditions and we do want to have meditation that's beneficial. So it's not to say we don't think in those ways, but it's wrong to think we can't practice until we get somewhere else. Because the practice, even then, is always going to be just here, right now. We can always practice because right now we're making choices. Choices of how we are going to be with this. It's not coming from our uh, you know, philosophy about it. We're not necessarily going to have to think about it. Although that does help too. It helps to have the right frame of mind, the right view, uh, even conceptually. And so we study the scriptures and we, we form Buddhist views about the world to help us experience things in ways that will uh, enable skillful action and, and reaction, skillful response, ways to be, which are less caught up in the old ways of uh, identifying and the old values that we may have had or inherited from the world, and instead become infused with new values that are more helpful, more conducive towards valuing peace and remembering this practice of being mindful and how important it is. So our views are important, the ways we think are important. And yet the actual practice of how we are right now and making this moment into the practice in an effective way, more and more is going to have less to do with thought and views and much more to do with awareness. And how we are coming from, where we're coming from in terms of our say, chetana, the, the volition or intention, just with being with our experience now. So we find ways of noticing our experience now which aren't bound up in our ideas about it. And teachings like the five khandhas, seeing things in terms of rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, vinyana, can become more than just teachings, philosophies, concepts, but things that we start to be able to Notice our experience right now in ways where we're not just caught up in the story of it, but we're able to, with awareness, see feeling as feeling, thought as thought, sensation as sensation, body as body, mind as mind. We can use these teachings in different ways to be able to experience things, whatever we're doing, whether we're sweeping, whether we're meditating, whether we're cleaning, whether we're just sitting, doing nothing, listening to the rain. There's always sanya, sankara, there's always rupa, vedana, there's always vinyana, there's always the awareness. 
awareness of things as they are is the point of the teachings so that we can stop making ourselves into something we're not and following blindly, impulsively, our wants. I don't want, I want, I don't want, I want, I am, I am not, I am, I am not. So these are things all of us have heard many times we can understand conceptually and we can't just simply approach them uh, reflectively through thought. So we do need to meditate, we do need to calm the mind, we need to be able to see more deeply. And a monastery like this is a place where not only are we encouraged to use our every day, every moment experience for practice, but also to deepen our ability to be aware of our every moment experience through specific exercises and techniques like uh, anapanasati and the different types of meditation we practice, which do require special conditions to pursue. So we have kutis in the forest, on the mountain, in the woods. We have a routine which is such that it is regular and it is demanding and it is also conducive to peace. It includes cleaning, not just meditating, and yet cleaning is a peaceful thing to do. It doesn't require much thought once you figure out where the broom is and where the cleaning fluid is and everything else. And it happens again and again. On Mondays you do this, on Tuesdays you do that, or else on one pra you do this, the day before one pra you do that. We have these uh, intentionally boring, repetitive lives in the monasteries so that we can actually not have to think too much but can use our experience in ways where we're transforming our life, transforming it through awareness by using whatever we're experiencing for our practice. So we deepen our minds through meditation. We're really careful with the precepts. Uh, these monasteries uh, that we have, uh, especially in our particular community are, are, are precious not only because of the, the contemplative spaces, the quiet spaces, and in, in that way sacred spaces that they provide, but they're also um, incredibly valuable because there's such an emphasis on keeping sila into a very high standard. So we really are careful with our precepts, whatever they might be. With the bhikkhus, be careful with the patimokkha and the other precepts that we have, um, and also lay people careful following the eight precepts while you're here and those of you who have made more commitment say upasikas and anagarikas and samaneras we have our eight precepts or our ten precepts and so they provide certain boundaries more than just the moral precepts of the first five but extra renunciatory precepts which give us places to come up against ourselves and in that way see ourselves. And it's extremely important in terms of uh, our practice, uh, more so at first even than meditation, to get those right and to really train with them and uh, give ourselves to being quite, quite careful and exact. And we don't have to be tight and we don't have to be um, overly uh, literalistic and strict and yet we do want to be very uh, careful in terms of our integrity in following the boundaries that we're asked to follow. And if we cross a line, then doing something about that. We have confession to each other as monks. We have ways of you know, communicating to others and asking for forgiveness and asking for help. And that way we support each other. And you know, on the face of it, it's not such a big deal. We, have our, once you get used to the precepts, they're not so difficult, you know, on the face of it. The reason they're difficult is because we are addicted to, I want, I don't want, I want, I don't want. And when we challenge that, the energy that comes is powerful. And it won't just be physical, it'll be primarily emotional and psychological. We won't be able to see when we're uh, getting it wrong sometimes. So we don't just do this on our own, we do it in community. And um, in that way, we help each other through having relationships where we'll see ourselves better. And we'll help each other through conversation. But often, much of the help we do is just through modeling good behavior. And we see ourselves for how we're being in the face of our contact with others who are able to be straight. So we use sila, we use samadhi, and we use panya. 
the panya is something which arises through our practice, and it's something which we, uh, you know, don't we don't we don't kind of uh, create, but we do orient ourselves towards our lives in ways to invite it. We we use our lives. We choose not just to believe the usual story that we're telling ourselves, but instead find a way to see this moment now for what it is. And what is it? It's rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, vinyana. There are ways to see that right now. It means I have to get out of my idea about what I'm thinking about and what's going to happen tomorrow and who's there. Who's, you know, the, the whole the whole lot of it. it doesn't mean all that disappears, but it does mean I need to take my uh, take the importance out of that and have more importance in just being very tuned into how I am now, what this experience is now, what's the experience in the body, what's the experience in the mind right now. So we don't need to do too much talking and chatting and conversing in our normal lives in the monastery, and there's a good reason for that, because it is a shift to start to uh, find a way of being where we're noticing the mind, noticing the body as we live, and we're not just kind of going from one thought to the next and one uh, conversation to the next. So we use our lives, and we, 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 we have this chance then to see that we don't have to be caught in our thoughts, in our feelings, in our emotions. We don't have to be caught in our hopes and our fears. And that then pays off because when we're challenged personally through some kind of suffering that's more extreme than the usual, some kind of health issue comes up or some relationship thing comes up, or in this case, you know, the fires come and we lose our houses, we lose our monastery perhaps, you don't know, there's a lot of uncertainty. Some of you here have lost your houses and it's a, uh, an incredible, powerful time which can be used uh, to, make, to make it into a jewel, a valuable jewel for all the, the tragedy that it involves from one perspective. Here we are, still able to practice still conscious, still healthy enough. And there's rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, vinyana. Form, feeling, perception, mental fabrications, or however you want to tra translate that very hard to translate term. All the stuff we do with our perceptions. And consciousness. It's never going to be right, whether we, you know, the monastery is never going to be finished, although I'm very glad it wasn't burnt down for Lumpa's sake and for the community here. But it's never going to be finished. We all know that. Something's always going to be breaking. There's always going to be something else that needs to be built. Even when it is, maybe it gets finished. There we are, still suffering until we're free. We're not going to be free until we find a way to be in this moment free. And it's always going to be right now. So my, my I uh, just, um, it's been a long week <laughs> for everyone. And I uh, just want to... Uh, express my thanks and, and um, for the hospitality. It's such a, a unique and, and um, challenging time. I thought it'd be more challenging. I thought I'd arrive and, and, and be carrying logs, ash, you know, and logs and um, sweeping ash and all kinds of debris. But uh, it's, it's all clean and doesn't seem like anything's been touched. The electricity's on. It's quite uh, al almost unnerving. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been quite pleasant, and uh, and yet it's been a, an emotional, emotionally exhausting week for most of you. I, I don't doubt. 
So I'll leave it there and and um, and just uh, anamodana for all of the blessings this place continues to create.